This is Twists. This Week in Science, episode number 966, recorded on Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024. Want to hear about science junk? I know you do. I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight we are going to fill your head with barcodes, bacteria leather, and junk. But first, thanks to our amazing Patreon sponsors for their generous support of Twists. You can become a part of the Patreon community at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. What goes on in your brain is never the same from moment to moment, from day to day, from year to year. As you experience things, your brain is commandeered by sensory cascades, by behavioral tirades, causing feedback loops that go on and on and on and on and on and on and, on and just like this week in science coming up next i've got the kind of mind that can't get enough i want to learn everything i want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week there's only one place to go to find the knowledge i seek i want to know Science, everyone, and welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again to talk about all the science that we want to fill your heads with. It's been filling my head all week long, so I got to share it, got to get it out somewhere. <sighs> Thank you so much for joining us. The show ahead is full of fun. And once again, I am joined by the incredible, the amazing, the fantastic Dr. Jessica Hebert placental biologist working at OHSU, Oregon Health and Science University here in Portland, Oregon, also a member of the PDX Broadsides, wonderful uh, band who has shared a stage with us in shows past. Jess, thank you so much for joining me again. I what I mean, what is going on? This is, It's been like two weeks. We went like four years without talking and now it's like it's two weeks. Here we are talking again. Yeah, basically, I, I don't know, but I love this trend for us and we should persist. And I told uh, Fada that uh, when I hit the five, the five time club for hosting, I do demand a smart laser. <gasps> oh, like SNL. Yeah, exactly. We're going to have to. Oh. Now I have a goal. Oh. So I have, I, this is a new idea. I'm liking it. Okay. Good. Yeah. A, Lasers. A laser. <laughs> I love it. Merch <laughs> ideas. This is what I bring to you. Yeah, but I'm trying to figure out now. I'm like, who has <laughs> been on the show aside from me, Blair, and Justin five times? I don't know. That's a hard one. I, I think this is my this is my fourth time. <gasps> so I so know. Close. Oh my We're gosh. So close. So you close. might be there in competition with Tom Merritt. He is he would be the other possibility, I think. I don't know. Then I'm right. Good Twist chat room brain. Think, think who may <laughs> have, <laughs> who may be the five timers club. Oh, this is so much fun. Um, I have stories that I've brought tonight about uh, some transistors made of molecules, uh, some legs, or maybe they're junk. I don't know. You got to talk about that one. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay, no the speed of vision, some barcoding birds. We've also got some naked mole rats who've got real heart. Uh, what you should do to vent that anger. Like I said, in the, in the uh, early show, bacteria leather. And to end the show, we're going to talk about a really disturbing robo mirror. And uh, Jess, I can't wait to hear your comments on all of these stories. I, I will provide comments. I did think of you this weekend. So back, uh, which episode was it that twisted the um, Alberta Rose Live show? I don't remember episode numbers, but I do know that it was 2019 because 2020 was the pandemic and it was uh, pre-pandemic. So 
go look up the episode. It's super fun. Everybody in the chat, um, my band, the PDX Broadsides did like live music, but it was amazing it was so fun to be on that stage. And you and Blair and Justin did an amazing job that night. And the audience was fantastic. Uh, but I was performing at the Alberta Rose this weekend and then got to think of you to be back there and in that green room where I learned a very interesting fact from you while we were back there. I don't remember if you, if you remember I, telling I me. Can I tell you? You told me that it takes 30 seconds for all animals to poop. <laughs> That was a study that had recently come out and I <laughs> You were so excited about it and I have never forgotten that fact. And so I'm in the back green it's room so at the Alberta Rose with a bunch of aerialists who are like warming up and some hoop mm. people and the suspension and person that I mentioned people. the last time I was on and I talk, got to talk to her about the physics of body suspension while she does opera uh, it was amazing it was so amazing cool. uh, yeah she does it under operafication it was one of the most incredible things I think I've seen on a stage in a long time it I was really to, I'm sorry I missed that 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 sounds really amazing I think there's a video of it and I'll send it to you but like hooks in your flesh and Ooh, you're up oh, in the wait. air. Oh, it's like Jim Rose sideshow theater kind of like yes yeah and okay. spinning as she's doing ritual opera wow. it was it was un I've never seen anything like it it was incredible um but I thought there is a lot of science there. <laughs> and I'm telling people the last time I was here, I learned that um, all animals poop in 30 seconds. So this is a different experience. Um, Tata says that the Alberta Rose live twist was five years ago today. What? Fada? I don't know, I don't know how that's that possible. Today, because of science talk, because it happened during the annual science talk, science communicators conference. That's and th that is, it's around this time of year. So, oh my gosh, welcome back. Five year anniversary, if not five timer club. Well, <laughs> I will, I will accept the cashmere scarf instead until we get up to the blazer level. That's but, right. With the, the twist cashmere, which is yes. Yeah. No, I love the show. It's such a pleasure to be back. Well, everyone, if you are enjoying uh, being here and this show and you know people that really should like the show i want to remind you that they can subscribe to the podcast anywhere good podcasts are found look for this week in science we also live stream wednesdays 8 p.m pacific time youtube facebook and twitch and uh, if you hit that little notification bell in addition to subscribing you're going to get notified when we go live you can also just look for this week in science all over the internet to find stuff about us our website is twist.org and new episodes are there with show notes every week thanks to our editor rachel but now okay you ready for some barcoding birds totally all right let's dig into the birds so this story is top of my list tonight because i studied bird brains for my phd and chickadees were one of the species that was that lived in the lab where i lived basically do my PhD. Um, and I went f doing field work, studying chickadees and chickadees, chickadee, dee, 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 and their little call. And <sighs> so <laughs> learning and memory was my field of study. And this study published in uh, the open access uh, 50 cell right now uh, it's on cell online uh researchers out of dmitry aronov's lab and i believe it's at columbia university have been working on understanding what's called episodic memory through the lens of these birds as a model species species so episodic memory is the where when you know like the who what where when how of a moment so right now I can say I'm in my studio and it is about 8.15 p.m. and I'm hanging out with Dr. Jess and I've got my chat rooms going and I'm talking about science and the, all this stuff and I've got a light in my face and I'm going to, there's a lot of stimuli that come together to create a moment 
that can become a memory. And you know how like habituation is the problem of things being the same all the time and your ne neurons don't respond the same way anymore. And so you might do the same thing every morning. And then when you do something a little bit different, your brain doesn't really pay attention. And so suddenly you lost your keys or your eyeglasses are up on top of your head instead of on your face and you're looking for them or it, you put your coffee cup somewhere and you don't remember where you put co your coffee cup. So your brain is trying to parse all this information and there are a few hypotheses as to how the brain does it and where episo how episodic memories get formed. The hippocampus is the part of the brain where after the limbic system and the emotions and the sensory stuff comes through, the hippocampus is like, let's take this information and we're going to turn it into something that's a memory. And we're going to send it to the rest of the brain for storage. And so the hippocampus is like, signal, signal, signal. What kind of signal am I going to make? And the hippocampus in hum humans, mammals is like between our ears, deep, deep in the middle of the brain. But in birds, it's very, at the very, very top of the head. So birds are awesome because they have very thin skulls and you can access their hippocampuses very easily because they're right on top, similar to reptile, the reptile brain, like lizards and others. Okay. So cool aspect of this study. They did recording from chickadee brains while the chickadees were hopping around a room and storing food and then going back to get that stored food at another time. So the, the storing of food is known as caching and then cache retrieval is when, that, when um, they go back and get it. And it's just honestly... <sighs> I have always loved chickadees and they are part of the Paraday family. Paradays are also, there's the great tit, there's other, lots of tits and the Siberian tit is a bird that lives very, very, very far in the Arctic North. And they are known to store up to 250,000 items over a fall winter season for survival. Yeah, you have to. Right. Uh, and chickadees, depending on uh, which subspecies of chickadee we're dealing with, uh, some of them can store up to 5,000 items a day at times. So, like, seriously, that's like, hey, I'm going to take... I'm going to take my milk, put it over here. I'm going to take my apples, put it over there. I'm going to take uh, some peanuts. I'm going to put them over there. Oh, my spinach, that's going to go over there. I mean, you put them all over the place, all over your house, all over wherever. And then you're like, oh, I'm hungry. Where do I go? They don't just have a refrigerator in the kitchen. They have to go back to all those different places and remember where they were. And so in this study, in recording from the brains of these active birds, which this is a technological advance. This in itself, being able to put electrodes into the brains of these birds so that they could be uh, independent and active and have the, these are tiny little tiny brains. So you have to have little, little tiny electrodes. And so the resolution, the ability to actually resolve individual neuronal activity, it's like, it's like the scale of stuff has gotten so tiny compared to when I was in graduate school. This is like, this is, this is, what they're doing is beyond. Yeah. Like, to me, this is, it, that in itself is an advance. But they got these birds, and uh, in the, uh, letting them run around this kind of what they call an uh, ethological paradigm. They've got a little space where the birds can hop around and there's little places that the birds can put things. And, you know, they thought that maybe there are these cells in the hippocampus that are called place cells that respond to particular places. They thought one hypothesis was, okay, the place cells are going to play a role in part of the design of the neuronal activity that takes place. The other hypothesis is that the place cells do not play a part in it at all. And uh, there are other, other parts of neuronal activity that are important. And so for these birds, they used high resolution cameras 
to resolve the uh, the motion of the birds, their body orientation to determine whether or not they were just poking at a potential place to put something or whether they actually stored something there. And then they gave them uh, an opportunity to go back into that area where they had stored lots of stuff and and go back and, and find things. And in the searching for places to store, when they stored something, there was a very specific set of neurons that fired together in a very specific way. And then when the birds went back and retrieved what they had stored, the exact same neurons fired again. So it was an exact replay of what had happened when they were uh, when they were initially storing. That's so cool. Yeah. And the fact that like these birds, they're just you can't even tell. They got feathers on their heads, they're going around, they're doing their business. These birds are storing food. I have uh this to me is magic. <laughs> I'm no uh, stranger but- to like small animal surgery because I, I do um transmitter probe insertion in mice and so having to line things up their carotid. I've done some brain work, but doing this in chickadees, that's super delicate work. That's so cool. Very delicate. And like these birds are, I mean, they're really wonderful birds. Um, but uh, because of the signals and the activity that has been identified and the fact that it is a, a retrievable code, they're calling it a barcode because it's very identifiable. It's a, it, it's a very short burst of activity, but it's a whole set of neurons that are firing kind of in this pattern at the same time. Yeah. Now, now what they don't know, so what they did find is that the place cells, even though there are like lots of spots where the birds could have used different cues to hide things and figure things out, the place cells were never active. Place cells were completely constant throughout. So the next question is, is the paradigm they put the birds in too small and too just kind of, it's like just one room, right? It's like you get used to being in one room and that's just the room, that's the place. And so did the birds' play cells habituate before the experimentation even took place? And so the play cells were just like, meh, whatever. And it was other neurons that were taking place in the active activation. Or... You know, so if they gave them different rooms to cash in, would that change and would the play cells then become active as part of this barcode? That's one question. Another question that they did not answer is planning. So what happens in the birds' heads when they go, I'm hungry, I want to go get something? Do they have a spurt of activity that is that exact barcode? that then leads to the behaviors and the motor activities that send them to the place? Or is it that they're just passing by a place and because it's familiar, the barcode, the neurons fire, and that is uh, what starts the act the activity. Uh, so they don't know how planning is involved in this or if planning is involved in it. Hmm. Yeah. In a room like that where safety is kind of equal across versus, you know, you're in the wild, a a tree or a bush might be more protected versus, yeah, I wonder what that looks like. Yeah. And there have been uh, studies with pigeons and lots of other birds where you have like larger navigational cues and there are different parts of the brain that are involved in the more uh, general navigation And then when you get to very local navigation, that shifts. And so there are different neurons and different brain networks involved in different types of navigation. It's like, um, you know, going from San Francisco, California to Portland, Oregon, you kind of know, just head north, you know, keep the sun in a certain place, you know, for 11 hours. Um, And then when you get to Portland, you have to figure out the right neighborhood to go to, the right street. The, the landmarks and so identification and the brain activity is very different. But anyway, I love this study. 
I think it's just one of the coolest things that I have come across recently because chickadees and the hippocampus. And the, yeah. So does this happen in our brains in the exact same way? That we don't know. So that is another good question. If it does, then you could call us bird brains. Does it be found in chickadees first? I'll be here all week. Being called a bird brain is a compliment. Maybe okay. It's yeah. great. It's a total compliment. Oh my gosh. Um, do you remember Zool- Zoolander? Was it Zoolander? Oh. I remember Zoolander. What about yes. Zoolander are we remembering right now? You the itty bitty teeny cell phone that Zoolander used. <laughs> it was like the, the, the tiny cell phone. It was making a joke about how technology and cell phones were just getting smaller and smaller and smaller at the so time. Tiny. And then they built the tiny little model of the school for him. So, <laughs> what is this? A school <laughs> for ads? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so we want to make things small. We like making things smaller and smaller and smaller, right? Yes. Um, and with technology, that is also the goal. Because if you can make the components of technology smaller, maybe you can stick more components into your technology. Um, and some of those things are transistors. Transistors are the off-on switches, right? That allow when electrons flow, it's like there's an off and there's an on. And there is the Moore's law, which is based on the materials that we use and the size of electrons and what we know about electron flow and quantum dynamics, there is a limit to how small our transistors can be. And we're running up against that limit currently. And so researchers are trying to figure out how to get past it and how can we, because what happens is at first it's like electrons are super nice and they're like, oh no, after you. No, no, after you. And they like to, they flow and they're like going one after another. And it's like, they go through the transistor. It's off, it's on, it's off, it's on, it's off, it's on. And everything's nice. But then you make the transistor smaller and smaller and smaller. And then the, the electrons are like, oh, I'm going to bump into you. And I'm going to bump into you. And oh, forget it. I'm just going to make my own pathway. And so um, they start quantum tunneling. And so there's errors and there's a lot of problems with the smaller transistors because of the way that the electrons interact with each other at this quantum scale is n- is no good for the technology it is not good you you you're sounding like uh the siberian <laughs> tit now <laughs> it is not good for the technology it's no good for the technology you know you take the technology <laughs> and you make small make small the technology and it uh, yeah, is is no good uh so you must make big make this make this big uh all right, the technology, these transistors, what are we going to do with the transistors? How do we make them smaller? How do we get more transistors without producing too much heat, without having too many errors in the data messages that are getting sent? How do we do this? Well, some researchers uh, just published their paper in which they're using, based on organic chemistry, molecules that are similar to hemoglobin. Um, zinc porphyrin is the molecule that they have used, connecting it to graphene. Graphene is a carbon based, uh, carbon based, uh, component structure matter. <laughs> My words just went away. Um, but graphene. It is hard to control exactly how it is. It's like graphite you know, uh, the carbon-based aspect of our pencils, but graphene needs to be uh, structured very specifically for things to be able to attach to it and to flow through very specific channels that are put into the graphene. And then in addition, you have to be able to add electrodes to either end so that, you know, positive electro, positive, negative, and then you complete circuits and can have that current that gets created uh, in the moment. All right. So we have the problem with the small transistors. In this particular case, they 
used zinc porphyrin because the researchers thought, huh, I mean, really, nature has solved a whole bunch of these things and electrons flow in interesting ways along molecules or are held by molecules all the time. So why not try using molecules that are found in nature and see if we can understand how electrons are will flow through them, are attracted to them or interact with them and just see if it works. And so it took about 10 years of research to get to the point where they published this paper. And in it, they have uh, taken two pieces of graphene, connected them by a single zinc porphyrin molecule and uh, tried to complete a circuit to test the transistor. And they indeed found that instead of the weird uh, quantum tunneling inter like behavior that wasn't it, the electrons weren't acting nice before, with the zinc porphyrin, the electrons are like, "Hey, how's it going? I like you." And the zinc porphyrin's like, "Yeah, hi, one at a time." And so the zinc porphyrin suddenly created a what they're calling it's an interference pattern so that in the same way that um, light interference patterns or uh, sound waves can interfere with each other. And so you have, if you have a, a down wave and an up wave, you know, a peak in a valley, those will cancel out. So that electron quantum behavior suddenly because of the zinc porphyrin became regulated and they were able to uh, reduce the size of the uh, the transistor uh, to well below where it is currently for most technology. They got really, really close to the ultimate limit. The channel length and the molecule just 2.1 nanometers long. And normally we've got channel lengths currently in transistors of 7 to 10 nanometers. Wow. And two nanometers is like what's thought of as the ultimate limit for right. getting electrons through a transistor ch ion channel. So the zinc, that's really cool. The zinc porphyrin ring is interesting. So where else do we see porphyrins? Where else do we see them? Tell me. Hemoglobin is yes. one of the big uh, ones where we see porphyrin mm -hmm. rings. So um, with that ring, you've got your... Um, oh, do you have a picture of it even? Yeah. Yes. So there's a porphyrin ring uh, in the middle. And um, what happens is if you've got iron, um, iron would sit right in the middle of where that X is, where the little red dot is. And the entire um, structure of the porphyrin ring bends when it binds to iron, but it can bind oh. to different forms of iron, which is why fetal hemoglobin and, um, adult uh, hemoglobin are different. They bind to um, iron in different ways. Um, so they Meaning? fetal hemoglobin is better. <laughs> yeah. Fetal hemoglobin <laughs> is better at transporting oxygen than adult hemoglobin is. So this is really important when you're developing, um, particularly if you can't really use your lungs to breathe, where are you getting your oxygen from? You're getting it from blood. Um, yeah. And fetal hemoglobin gets replaced and becomes mature hemoglobin over the course of the first six months or so of life. So that's, yeah, you become really good at oxygenating for the first period of your life. Um, so with all these changes in uh, Confirmation, dynamics, right? Yeah, being able to use a porphyrin ring to have zinc, which uh, can readily interact with other electron uh, configurations, that's really great, um, and is probably why their transistor is being so successful right now. That's super cool. Using something that biology had already kind of figured out in order to make a better transistor. Yes, and this is one of my favorite things when science uses what's already in nature as inspiration for our next steps in advancement um, and figuring things out. But I mean, it's it's like, oh, nature already did that. But now we're figuring out why it did it. Okay. Oh, that's, oh, we'll do that too. That's great. Um, or we'll use it this way. So uh, unfortunately, though, we're not going to see our little teeny tiny Zoolander cell phones anytime soon because this is still in the lab and they haven't worked out a lot of the details about the electrodes and how to control the graphene and 
making oh, everything work goodness, well. Because my little chickadee barcodes don't work very well, and I lose my phone <laughs> all the time at the size it is. So my <laughs> <somebody's> smaller. <laughs> Where is your cell phone? I don't know. My Barbie has it. It's fine. Um, uh, yeah, but this suggests, though, that there is another pathway to reducing the size of transistors that's a little bit different than uh, the traditional um, the traditional element way of silicon chips uh, inside her head that we have been um, looking at historically. So, um, yeah, this not only will potentially lead to new smaller transistors, maybe, who knows, don't hold your breath anytime soon, but it's also going to give us information about how uh, organic molecules interact with electrons and how uh, how electrons, how energy, how current flows um, through organic material and uh, various materials in our world. Material science, so cool. Wait, wait. Especially uh, when you present it. <laughs> That's right. When I when I present it, it gets to be a lot of fun. Uh, but now we're going to talk about junk. Junk. And yes, yes, and this is right up your alley. Not placentas, but embryos. How dare you mm. say junk is up my alley? <laughs> <laughs> my alley has been swept clean. <laughs> junk. See, I don't even mean things that come out of my mouth sometimes. Oh, dear, dear gracious. Uh, so these uh, researchers in Portugal, the Gol Benkian Science Institute that is in Ueras, Portugal, have been looking at a receptor protein, TGFBR1, and this is involved in embryonic development. They have been looking at it in mouse embryos and they wanted to see like, hey, if we get rid of it or inactivate it, what does it do to the spinal cord? The spinal cord and the neural tube, very important for development uh, into a fully functioning uh, organism, mammal, vertebrate. And the graduate student who was involved in the study was like looking through the results and was like, hmm, I found something. This was not expected, and uh, I think you want to see this. And uh, what they found is that by uh, getting rid in one case, and they followed they followed up on this research, and uh, this is where this paper came from, uh, is that uh, the mouse embryo, one of the mouse embryos, how, instead of having genitals, had six legs. It also had its internal organs basically on the outside of its body. So this isn't something that is uh, going to uh, turn us all into tardigrades or other very, you know, multi-legged creatures in any way, shape or form. But the question is why, you know, why continue down this path of uh, messing with the, the gene and altering these mouse embryos to uh, to see what's going on there. And in this particular case, uh, the researchers have known for a very long time that four-limbed animals, uh, they, they weren't always four-limbed. We've had lots of different kinds of limbs. We've had tails. We've had multiple limbs. It's, it's, been, a, it's been a whole thing. And um, the primordial cellular basis, so the, the group of cells that our lower body come from, our limbs and our lower legs and the genitalia, um, they all come from the same place. And they determined in this study that this particular gene, TGFBR1, can uh, is in charge of telling cells what they're going to do, whether they're going to be genitals or whether they're going to be legs. And so the question is, how is this, uh, this gene involved in uh, development of things like uh, double penis in reptiles, reptilian hemipenis? We've got um, other organs that aren't legs. Uh, we have 
you know, lizards that don't have legs and look like snakes. Um, there are other aspects of the dysregulation of this gene that can uh, interact with the immune system and lead to uh, metastatic cancers. And so there are some really very interesting uh, implications for understanding in the long term how the embryos uh, of all mammals, vertebrates, uh, humans as well, um, how they become four-legged or six-legged or with genitals or not genitals. Um, and with the immune system as well, we know that the immune system impacts gene regulation and the immune system is affected by sex hormones. And so there may also be some aspect of hormonal regulation that is involved in the body form of, you know, of, uh, of animals that, that have multiple, multiple sex forms. Um, how, how does everything end up the way it is? Well, we talked, I think the last time I was on the show a couple of weeks ago, we talked about body planning and how uh, certain segments are like, are programmed to be in a certain way, unless they're stimulated under other circumstances. So in this case, um, in mice, at least, I think I, I did a, a quick read of this news article and they mm -hmm. changed the expression of TGFR one beta or beta one um, partway through uh, gestation. Right, at different mouse times. Yeah. Right. So mouse gestation is about 19 days. Um, and you don't actually get embryo implantation into the uterus until about day five. Um, and the interaction between uh, the fetus and the maternal systems, like that placenta doesn't fully come online until about day 12. Um, hmm. So this is all fetal development because the limb buds are developing and they start to differentiate around day 10-ish. Hmm. And for them okay. to manipulate that, um, the limb buds that they manipulate, the genitalia, it's long been thought that... Um, penis, clitoris, other external genitalia organs seen in other animals are formed kind of on the same like limb bud differentiation. So they just went ahead and proved it. Um, but they also showed that TGF beta, you can see that bulging belly in uh, panel B. Yeah, the internal organs. There's other mm -hmm. stuff involved at keeping your insides where they're supposed to be. <laughs> So right. that it's not probably, just limb buds it's also a whole thing <laughs> right and, well it also makes cartilage and if you don't have enough cartilage in that area then you don't have mm. an adequate abdominal wall um it can also stimulate fetal growth factor which is important to development of the organs so maybe they've got too much organ at that stage and that's why it's coming out so lots of reasons why you know, we're not going, I, I love that you said we're not going to become tardigrades any kind of soon, time soon, <laughs> no. because that's what it looks like to me. But <laughs> yeah, it, it does seem, which yeah. is a great name for a band. <laughs> Fetal tardigrade. Yes. Fetal tardigrade. Oh my gosh. It's a prog rock band for sure. Totally. <sighs> totally. So yeah, right. Body mapping. Super cool stuff. I think the you know body mapping is uh, it some people from the the outside will be like well it's just where things get end up but in terms of uh developmental disorders and differences specifically in in humans if we can find targets to address uh genetically or even therapeutically while in utero or uh, you know even in in vitro during IVF um, treatments and and processes, you know there is the possibility that we can have healthier, uh, more developmentally, physically, morphologically stable and functional offspring moving into yeah. the future. Yeah, 
especially if we something is going wrong, can we manipulate that that gene back into alignment? If it's if it's a naturally occurring mutation, can we can we affect it? And can we uh, methylate that region of of gene expression in order to shut it down? Once we understand the mechanism of how things are broken, we can figure out how to get them right again. Uh, yeah, and I think that I think that point that you brought up about methylation is very important because uh, you don't want to necessarily perpetuate genetic dysfunctions that. Uh, even though you can fix them technologically, you don't want to have to keep doing that generationally over and over and over again. So can you repair something so that it is then genetically the, the fixed, quote unquote, fixed? I'm, you know, I don't want to be ableist, but um, you know, the repaired yeah. version then is perpetuated for better survival of a lineage. Right. And we don't want to go yeah. into eugenics, but like, how do no. we... How do we improve human health uh, safely in a way that still allows people to be the people that they were meant to be? Yeah. And yeah. allows people to, you know, if they want to have kids, to have the kids, right? To be able to that's do that. That's the ideal. That's the ideal. Mama. If you don't want to have kids, that's great too. <laughs> yes. Whatever you want to be doing. Yes. Okay, so let's talk for this last story of this part of the show. Let's uh, talk about vision. Now, um, I have always complained about the flicker of fluorescent lighting. Back when we had CRT computer screens, I had to change the uh, the speed, the hertz of the refresh rate of the screen because it, if it was 50, I was I, it gave me like a headache to sit at a computer. And, and so I had to set it to 60 Hertz because that was, those were the only things you could do with your CRTs, 50 or 60. But anyway, flicker fusion frequency, that is a genetically determined uh, processing rate of your visual system. And if you have a lower flicker fusion frequency, then uh, you don't care about fluorescent lights. You don't see them flickering. It's all fine. And if you like old technology now or grew up like I did with CRTs, once upon a time, 50 hertz was fine. If you have a faster flicker fusion frequency, that means that your neurons are timed differently and are able to see quicker changes in lighting. And we've known that this is there are differences in individuals, in people for a long time. And we know that there's there are differences between species for a while. But this new study that has uh, just been published in PLOS One, researchers put a whole bunch of peop people into um, some funky goggles to be able to measure their critical flicker fusion thresholds to really get a high resolution of the variance between individuals and this it, it this this image of a of the apparatus that they use which is like a pair of goggles that's attached to a tube like it's kind of like a like a pair of like binoculars or i don't know like an and then there's an encoder, a rotary encoder that flashes a light inside of it or a screen. It it makes me think of something out of like 1950s, like sci-fi movies. I'm just saying Google Glass got really hardcore all of a sudden. <laughs> it absolutely did. The new Apple uh, Glass has just gone extreme. Oh, extreme. It's so extreme. You can't even stand it. Like you have to attach it to the wall and then just walk up to it and stick your face in it. Or, you know, it's on your coffee table and you bend over and put your, your face in the goggles. Anyway, this paper, I I think it is very fun because what they are are showing is that there is a real between and also for women specifically within individual variation. So they had um, a bunch of individuals that they uh, they looked at at different times of day and they uh, used various stimuli uh, at different uh, different flicker 
rates of this, these LED lights, um, and they increased. They used the dial to increase it by one hertz increments until suddenly the individual could not perceive the flicker and only saw set steady light. And if the flicker fusion frequency stuff that I've been talking about to anybody here is just still doesn't make sense. If you think of it as uh, movies with the film rate, uh, 24 frames per second is the absolute brain bottom limit that we've got where you can put moving images together and they appear, our brain turns it into a constant flow and, and puts the images together into something that approximates the real world. So that 24 FPS is basically like, that's why <laughs> it's 24 frames per second is to give us this really nice, good view of the world that's not real, but our brains go, yeah, that's real. That's great. 60 FPS, which is a lot of phones right now. Like it, I don't like it that much. It's a little bit too much, but a lot of people like it, but it's not about me. So the... The researchers uh, looked at variation, and in the end, they determined that, yes, indeed, there are individuals who have significant innate advantages. And so I think that is the big question, whether that we've had for a very long time, is it learned? Is it something like when you talk about gamers who are faster and like quicker and more able, you know, to to or race car drivers? Uh, who are able to react to things very quickly? Is it just they learned the skill or is there some innate component? And this study has kind of twisted it and in their methods been able to say that, oh yeah, there are some people who innately, their brains are wired to be faster than others. And so they have a natural advantage in terms of temporal resolution as we view our world. And so those uh, those individuals, so it's not just between species, like predator versus prey, which that's an interesting kind of question to dig into. But, um, you know, for gamers, for, like I said, different people who are into different sports, for certain individuals doing, uh, doing different activities, um, what does the difference mean to uh, everyday activities, to survival? How has it impacted our evolution to date? How does it impact, how will it impact or uh, our, our brain processing and things that we do into the future as we're using technology more and more and more? And screens are such a big part of our lives. Um, I think these are really interesting questions. Um, so the frame rate of our visual system in our brains is important. And the one thing that I thought was really interesting is they definitely found a difference in women over time. And so that to me, I find I'm, I want to know more about that. Yeah. I don't know how much we have the capacity to process. Like at what point does the FPS exceed our ability to actually cognitively process what it is that we're seeing right yeah um it's like having a, a computer with only so much memory um yeah. <laughs> you can you can throw it at you at, at me as fast as i can but you know at some point i'm not going to be able to keep up right and so that's the difference between maybe you know different individuals and perhaps this is some aspect of different brain uh architecture for like ADHD or, you know, it, these are not disorders. They are different architectures and different brain types, neurotypes. And uh, for different, you know, different people, you know, some people are, you know, perhaps the good hunters. And there was a study that suggests that uh, people with ADHD might be good foragers because they are constantly looking for like, oh, look at that over there. Oh, look at that over there. Oh, look at that. You know, with the vigilance. Right. Of, yeah. Evolutionarily designed. Uh, mm -hmm. in order to complete tasks in the environment in which they were best accustomed to, which I think is another story that we're going to talk about tonight. So it is, which we're going to keep moving forward because, oh my goodness. <sighs> Did everyone else have a long day? <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day, y'all. 
This is This Week in Science. Thank you so much for being here. We have a few more stories to go. I want to thank Dr. Jess Hebert for also joining me tonight. Um, we have more stories, but before that, head to twist.org. Click on the Patreon link if you want to help support us in an ongoing fashion. You can choose your level of support, $10 or more, and we will thank you by name at the end of the show, $15 or more. And I think you get a sticker every few months, new stickers that Blair Blair art, which is pretty cool. We've also got t-shirts as different rewards and thank yous for your support. Our Zazzle store also is full of merchandise that proceeds go to help continue keeping the show on the air. And if, you know, you just want to get a friend to subscribe, go, go tell a friend today, take their phone and use it to subscribe to Twist, or take their phone and subscribe them to Twist. But I wouldn't tell you to do that. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Yeah. Consent, everybody. This is This Week in Science coming on back. Dr. Hebert, we have some more stories, don't we? I'm super excited for this one. You are. This Okay, this story. <sighs> it marries together two of my loves um, of science in a very weird way. So I'm excited. <laughs> the weird is always good here. Yeah. It's what, it's, it's, we enjoy the weird, yes. And in this <laughs> particular case, it is the secrets of the naked mole rat. A very weird species of mole rat. Um, this mammal, this is, uh, it's a very odd mammal. It lives in little tunnels under the ground. It's basically blind. It doesn't have any fur. It's not, it has big buck teeth. It's so cute. Like, really, they are just so very, very cute. Um, if you like you know, that kind of naked mammal kind of thing. Um, you call them the sand puppies? Sand puppies? Isn't that adorable? Oh, I love it. Sand puppies. Yeah, these sand puppies can live up to almost 40 years. Which, you know, if you were able to take care of them, it's like half the life of a parrot. So you, you're taking on a very large responsibility with this kind of a mammal. Um, but why do they live so long? It's because they have a bunch of really interesting genetic differences. Not just that they don't have hair and they have these little tiny blind eyes and the big buck teeth they use to go after the little insects and things that they eat below the ground. No, no, no. When they're underground, very often they are in areas with not very much oxygen because they're digging these little tunnels and sometimes the tunnels collapse and they're stuck underground. Sometimes they're in areas where there is no oxygen. Think of it, no light. Their tunnel is collapsed. You're just digging, 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 and there's no oxygen. What? How do you survive? I mean, suddenly <laughs> your heart stops. You're deprived of oxygen in your blood because your blood's not... your. Heart, uh, Pumping. <laughs> that's going to kill a human or it's going to be very damaging to a lot of cells in uh, the human brain and body and how can we be more like naked mole rats this is the big question I said no one until right now <laughs> <laughs> I always ask the big questions uh, researchers have published in Nature Communications this study of the heterocephalus glaber, this naked mole rat, um, and the genetic basis of the resistance to low oxygen levels or hypoxia as a model of cardiovascular disease. They basically gave these uh, little mole rats heart attacks and then looked to see what happened. And they found there are a lot of adaptations that differences in glycogen which is for uh, glucose storage enzyme and uh, gly glycolytic ATP which is also a uh, part of the energy cycling of cells and the metabolism that happen um, and so cardiac is ischemia is the damage or the lack of oxy oxygen to cardiac cells and whereas in a human heart if there's no blood or oxygen getting to those cells that have <clears throat> clenched up and aren't pumping, aren't doing their work in the heart, those cells are going to die. And that's going to be scar tissue in your heart. And then your heart doesn't work as well anymore. Um, but these uh, mole rats were like, what's up? I'm fine. Go dig another tunnel. 
<laughs> totally I love cool. extremophiles. They're so <laughs> wild. I studied Archaea um, for my first, uh, my second rotation in grad school, and there are things mostly uh, multicellular um, organisms that do things like uh, flourish next to volcanic vents yeah. and in arid conditions. And the mole rat is kind of the epitome of that. Um, and their oxygen, one of the reasons why they survive hypoxia so well is going back to that porphyrin ring. Your hemoglobin's different. Oh, interesting. It's a little bit closer to fetal hemoglobin. It binds oxygen more efficiently, which is why they can survive without oxygen longer. Hmm. I want yeah. that. I need to go. Oh, don't wow. I have to go, go like live and have multiple generations of myself at high altitude to be able to do that? Or. <laughs> Well, if you live at high altitude long enough, you get preeclampsia. So let's not oh, do that. Let's yeah, not do that. that. That develops in your family line. So let's not. Okay, fine. Um, but what's uh, what's fascinating is that this is giving us, this study gives us, uh, again, as we talk about in, you know, biology and genetics and genomics that are interested in um, how we can use this information for human life extension, for uh, treating heart attacks, for extending the life of individuals who have had heart attacks, for keeping people from having heart attacks who maybe have uh, genetic mutations that make them uh, more likely to have them. If we know what the genes are that are involved, like that are involved and most adapted in this naked mole rat, sand puppy, maybe just maybe we can do some good for people yeah and and our dogs and our cats and you know, other mammals that are long-lived but they're such an interesting species they're they are my second favorite weird uh rodent species what's your first favorite <laughs> the spiny mouse which is not a mouse uh, and they're crazy because if you give them like basically what acute kidney injury would would do to uh, hurt their kidneys, their kidneys are fine. They but regenerate. So cute. They regenerate limbs, and they are the only member of rodentia that gets periods. They Wait, menstruate. Oh. Yeah. So <laughs> That's fascinating. Yeah, the spiny mouse. So it's not they're, a mouse they're... though. But they're, are they a rodent? Uh, I don't think... They might not be a part of rodentia. I may have misspoken. But they are... Oh, I feel like they are. Um, there's a great lab at UW... Spiny um, mouse menstruate? ...lab that studies spiny mm -hmm. mice. Oh, these are cool. They can regenerate skin. They menstruate. They've got organ regeneration. What? I, okay, I didn't know about spiny mice. And... They are a member of Rodentia. They are order Rodentia, a family Meridae. So they are mouse proper, but then they split off from there. Moose They're mouse Meridae. adjacent. <laughs> they, are, they are moose adjacent, for sure. Um, but yeah, they are members of Rodentia. They're crazy. So yeah, two of my favorite things, extremophiles and weird rodent species together on this track. It's great. Yeah. Did you have any other comments about the naked mole rat study? About the sand puppies? No, I, I think that cardiometabolic effects are really interesting. And the other half of uh, my mentor's projects. Um, so I do pregnancy following recovered acute kidney injury, and what that means for the pregnancies and then the offspring. And the other half of his interests lie in CACPR, which is cardiac arrest, cardiopulmonary resuscitation mm -hmm. in mice and studying how that affects um, their hearts and their kidneys and what things are expressed and how that changes the size of their hearts. We basically make, um, we we say that we're the only lab on campus with a 200% death rate because we give them cardiac arrest and then we bring them back. And then you... D d d d <laughs> oh, they, the they morbid lab humor. <laughs> I know, I know. But um, they are treated 
they are uh, treated well. extremely well and uh, we follow all, all care protocols, but it's how we understand if you went through a heart attack, what does that mean for the long-term outcomes for your organs and um, what does that mean for how we can treat you better? So or even not, works. or even like you're talking about just kidney function, right? So you've got things like that you study, like preeclampsia and other issues that are related just to pressure issues of yeah, a fluid flow within the body. Um, you know, does preeclampsia impact heart function after pregnancy? That's a very good question. Um, we know that uh, you are more likely, if you have preeclampsia, you are more likely to have um, cardiovascular issues later in your life. Um, mm -hmm. As as the uh, gestational parent, you are more likely to have high blood pressure um, and cardiac stress. Um, I think you are also at a higher likelihood for stroke, um, amongst other <laughs> things. Yeah, so it's... So eat your vegetables and make sure you've got lots of fiber so your microbiome is happy and uh, you have antioxidants and your stress is low and you sleep all the time, which I didn't. So <clears throat> during pregnancy, I don't think anybody does. Nobody does. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was amongst That's some happened. of the worst sleep in my life. Yeah. Oh, restless legs. Where do you yeah. want to go? <laughs> our, our kids are totally worth it, but totally. Um, and I, I don't know if they made the the podcast cut, but on the live stream, both of our our Kiki's uh, son and my son both made appearances on the show. Um, we love them beyond reason, uh, beyond science. <laughs> and they drive us to wondering where our reason went. And sometimes our emotions get the better of us and we might get angry, uh -oh. <gasps> but you don't want to, you have to be a good parent. You have to like model good behavior. And so you don't want to be the parent attacking other parents at the baseball game. What do you do with the anger that is inside of you? Boiling. There is a hypothesis that uh, you should have a cathartic release. And that for some people, yelling or uh, doing something violent to a pillow or throwing something or, you know, not actually going through on the instinct to uh, to attack or hurt some other living being or person, but a cathartic release in which nothing is really damaged yet. You, it is kind of a violent, physical release of the anger. That's the hypothesis that has uh, kind of been predominant for many, many years. However, we also have heard of, you know, uh, Daniel Kahneman, may he uh, rest in peace, uh, System 1, System 2, the uh, fast thinking fast and slow. We have our fast emotional brain and our slow, rational brain. And so we might come to anger very quickly, but then if you take the conscious effort to take a breath, count to 10, it might give you the opportunity to release the anger in a different way or let it dissipate. And so uh, the researchers in this particular study they did a meta-analysis and looked at a whole bunch of uh, of different studies, <laughs> and they uh, they had people they observed individuals as well uh, to to see what if they were put in different groups. There was a total of a ten thousand over ten thousand participants, um, and really, you know, this what I love from the uh, press release about this study is that the research was inspired by in part the popularity of rage rooms. Oh, those are great. Have you, I've you never been to a rage room. I don't know what a rage room is, but I guess you go, you pay money to smash things to be the Hulk. I mean, um, I don't want to do that for anger. I just feel like it might be fun, but well, fun. <laughs> I took my husband to one up in Vancouver, Washington and they turned on a great soundtrack for us and handed us some markers and a whole room full of 
weapons from crowbars to baseball bats and whatever. What? And we just got the smash plate, like old plates and bottles and things. And we wrote like, you know, feelings or things that we wanted to go away on them and just smashed things for about an hour. And it was lovely. <sighs> okay. So the I question, yeah. So the question, so you, so you took the feelings the anger that you wanted to go away and you smashed them. And so it was this physical kind of like, ah, I'm angry at you. Go away. It's fun. Cathartic. Yes. But would you have perhaps had the same experience if you sat in meditation and imagined those things as uh, helium balloons that you named and you let them loose yeah, and you let them go on their own? Or there's, yeah. there's been a lot of research into whether like screaming and letting things out actually induces cortisol response versus um, relaxation response. Um, I'm reading a book right now called uh, Burnout, um, The Secret to oh. Unlocking the Stress Cycle. Those, yes, that's a great book. And in the first, yes. in, in that first section, um, so it's twin sisters mm -hmm. who one teaches women about burnout and the stress yes. cycle. And the other one has gone through it, like has been hospitalized with um, extreme physical manifestations of stress. So they wrote this book together and they say, you have to complete your stress cycle and you have to go and do something physical and get it out. But I feel like the biggest changes that have come when I have faced uh, frustration or adversity is like doing something and getting out of your body is important, but I feel like things like yoga are better than punching things. <laughs> For me, that is For my you. personal experience. But okay. I will say that smashing things with a crowbar is super fun, and I do recommend doing it in the safe parameters. I'm I'm always going to have fond memories of the day right prior to uh, going away to college that. Uh, there was a uh, a car that a uh, a renter on my dad's property had left behind, and my dad had a uh, a backhoe, and he let me drive the backhoe and destroy the car with a backhoe, and I flipped the car, I smashed the wind the 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 windshield, I tore the hood off. Uh, that car was a wreck by the time. I mean. I got to drive a backhoe. I got to smash a car. I wasn't angry. That was just fun. Yeah. <laughs> People love going to monster track, uh, truck rallies for the same or uh, yeah. demolition derbies. But I, if you're feeling rage, I don't think that you mm -hmm. should get behind the wheel. No, um, road rage is real oh. and it is a problem. Yeah. Or even at a demolition derby, something that because you aren't, fully in control of your emotion at that point. So it's right. it's a different can of beans. Yeah, so with this study what I think is is very interesting um is that they analyzed over 150 studies. They also had you know looked at the different things that uh that individuals did. Um so meta analysis and they determined that the more meditative and uh, still physical, but different release of of the emotion uh, was more effective than arousal. So arousal yeah. decreasing activities were better than arousal increasing or maintaining activities. And so it depends on, you know, individuals you know, if you are the kind of person where going for a run is meditative, then that might calm you down. But, but if, if you, you are like, running. if you hate running, I'm going to go. <laughs> I'm going to get my rage up by doing the thing I hate. Well, then no. But if, if you like, you know, stretching, yoga, doing, mm -hmm. um, walking your dog, uh, one of the things in burnout was they say, um, kiss someone you like for six seconds because oh. it is a physical activity and you don't kiss somebody that you don't like for six seconds. No. And it six seconds that. is a significant amount of time. 
Yep. So it <laughs> slows your, your brain down a little bit. So I tested this theory the other day. My husband loved it. He was big. I'm fan. sure he did. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry. Like, Great. <laughs> You're like, this I need to science. change my mindset. <laughs> yeah. And you Thank know you. what? Yeah, it does. It does make you like, it gives you that connection and it does like, uh, help complete that arousal response. So yeah. cool. Right. Yes. And I think that we need to remember the, the, the bottom line here is that we are embodied, uh, psyches. So it's not just our brain. Our emotions are not just in our brain because things have come in and made our brain mad. We feel it in our bodies and our bodies are part of also releasing it. And so, uh, whatever it is that you do, um, this particular study suggests that, uh, yeah, beating things up and venting, screaming, arousing yourself into, ah, is not the way to do it. But that is not saying that you should not still be mindful of your physical body and the way that the emotion is impacting you. Being angry is okay. The way that you handle it, that's on you. Anger is a sign that a boundary is being crossed and that you need to make make more specific limits. Anger is something you're mad because somebody did something. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Welcome to this Top week in five. therapy with unlicensed <laughs> therapists, Dr. Kiki and Dr. Jess. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, we have uh, just a very quick couple of stories to finish out the show. So um, are you a uh, vegetarian, vegan, eat meat? How do you feel about um, the sustainability and the impact of the uh, meat and leather industry on our planet? Well, way to put me on the spot. Yeah, uh, I'm, yeah just put I'm, me there. <laughs> I, I'm an omnivore. Um, I I think that there's there's room for lots of things in my diet, um, but I'm also a big believer in using all the parts. So, um, you know, use all the parts of the cow, use all the parts of the chicken, and we do try to replace some of our meat with other protein sources like beans and um, that sort of thing. But we you know, we, we definitely, red meat is a good source of iron. And as women, uh, especially uh, women who are premenopausal, uh, sources of iron are very important and sometimes yeah. hard to come by inexpensively. So red meat's kind of a good way to do that. It is. And, you know, it's, it, until we all end up eating insects, um, that's just where we are. But um, there are places that sustainability can be uh, uh, altered in uh, in the way that we uh, develop different materials. So yes, full circle use of animals, highly recommend. If the meat is being eaten, the other parts of the animal should also be utilized. Yeah. But there's a, that's just a lot of stuff, resources that go into growing an animal over a lifetime, um, you know, years uh, to get a cow or uh, or a year or so to get a pig to or a goat to wherever it needs to be versus, uh, you know, like a, I don't know, a couple of weeks to culture a vat of bacteria to create a substance that's not bacteria but is uh, cellulosic chains that are like leather hmm. and that can also uh, color themselves using uh, like melanocytes. So the, the bacteria could be grown to create fibers that you know, it's still vegan, even though, I mean, that's what the researchers are saying, but, uh, you know, it, essentially the material is created by the bacteria in the process. The, the bacteria also are like, oh yeah, we're going to uh, make that brown. That's going to be black. It's going to look like alligator skin. It's going to be black leather. Um, huh. And uh, they just published their their study in uh, nature biotechnology and 
it's really uh, it's a really promising study and it goes to show how far we can take bacteria to create potential solutions for the future uh, so that we can have materials that uh, that might work for us so for instance they were able to create flat sheets of this leather like material from the bacteria uh, black leather sew it together and create a wallet I wonder how well it holds up under, like, if it's durable. So the thing, it is durable, and that is one of the things that they uh, that they they were all were also looking at is because of the the cellulose. It's also um, it's going to be a a good replacement for the fake leathers, the pleathers that yeah. we already use, but that are that from down. fossil fuels, right? Yeah. So they come from oils, um, and one of the one of the super fun uh, things that they created that they they created a mold and grew a shoe <laughs> using the bacteria. They created a mold and used it to uh, grow back to the bacteria in a way that they uh, they grew within the mold parameters and released the cellulose and um they stuck it on a a cushy sole and so it's a a, a pleather black black pleather little mid boot mid ankle boot <laughs> with toe grooves but could you imagine you take a little uh you could do 3d scans or even a reverse wax casting of your own foot and potentially with this technology doing if, if you're a DIY biologist this is the kind of thing you could create a mold of your foot and make your own shoes i mean kind of cool but also just kind of gross i don't know there's something about <laughs> it that in, strikes me as being inherently icky well i mean the, the shoe that they've made it's you know it's pleather and it's like you know those um the jelly shoes the jellies that were once really popular except they don't oh, have yeah. this particular shoe doesn't have any holes in it for for breathing so you stick your foot in it it's that foot funk is just gonna stay in there and uh, not uh, go anywhere okay, now everyone can see the face <laughs> i'm making <laughs> You know what? I think it's very promising in that there are probably things that we currently make out of plastic that yes. could definitely benefit from being remade. And um, yeah, if, if there are uh, leather-like things that would benefit from this process too, that's great. Um, as long as there are still people using cows, though, I feel like we should still be using the leather. And leather right. This is isn't going to completely remake yeah, it's not going to completely replace it. Absolutely not. But in terms of the uh, the things that are coming from fossil fuels or other less sustainable sources, this might be uh, an alternative moving into the future. They want a two million pound grant in funding from the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council, part of the UK Research and Innovation uh, granting system to use this engineering biology and bacterial cellulose to solve more fa more problems in the fashion industry uh because pretty, pretty cool well we're we live in an era of fast fashion so yes. um yeah but we also need to retrain ourselves to be stop slow yeah <laughs> buy things that are going to last a little bit longer if you can uh but re oh, reuse God. and recycle places like poshmark and thread up um mm -hmm. want you to reuse your clothing so you know, Ridwell, that. you can donate your used threads, uh, which is, uh, you know, clothing. It's you put it in a bag, they take it away. They use uh, the the fabrics from all the things to create, you know, to recycle into new fabrics and new items. Uh, it's another recycling thing. But anyway, uh, yeah, plastic based leather and leather. They're also not just like where they come from, but also there's other chemicals involved that aren't great and awesome. So. Um, Potentially, this is more sustainable and a uh, cleaner way to move forward in fashion and in other directions. 
bacteria for textiles. But what about a robot who mimics you? Have you ever played that game where you try and play mirror and you, you know, you do what the other person's doing and you try and like predict what they're going to do before, like, so you're doing it at the exact same time. Oh yeah. Mirror mirror mirror. Are crazy. Yeah. And so, yes, we know that now we have mirror neurons. There's the, there's a whole brain synchronization that occurs when you interact with people, even through something like, in like this video stream, as we're talking to each other and connecting, uh, and, and I'm like, okay, she needs to go to bed. Um, we're, you know, I, we are connecting and synchronizing on topics and ideas and able to have a conversation. And the reason that we can converse is because our brains are predicting what might be said next, what could be coming next. Um, whether you're going to smile, whether you're going to frown, are you going to be happy, whether you're not, and our brains are wonderful prediction machines, but so is the algorithm, the generative algorithm that is trained on facial expressions to learn how to express itself. Uh, researchers at Columbia uh, Engineering have built a robot named Emo. Oh. Emotion, Emo. Uh, and they have used a nice, soft silicon material uh, to make it have like a face and it's got little cameras in its eyes but it can make eye contact and they're using a couple of artificial intelligent uh, you know machine learning algorithms uh, to monitor facial expressions and predict future facial expressions in humans that the robot face might be interacting with um, and then to be able to create its own facial expressions in synchrony to mimic the people that this robot emo could be connecting with. <sighs> so cool. emo. So emo. Yeah. yeah, emo could be cool. Uh the researchers like they're really like the uh, the press release for this one's great. I mean, this is uh, Science Robotics is where it is published this week, but uh, this robot, they they foresee this robot being able to interact with humans as a, an advanced general intelligence embodiment. So the, the idea is that artificial intelligence, when it gets advanced enough to be its own thing and sense itself and interact with others in the way that humans do, the sociality and sense of self and theory of mind kind of stuff, but this kind of robot that emo is going to be the body that will interact with people. So emo, emo, emo creeps me out. Um, so emo <laughs> has been created by this, uh, wonderful, wonderful engineer, uh, and taken this robotic head with the camera eyes and they've designed this robot that can observe people's facial expressions um, and make its own facial expressions. And the timing in talking to people is everything, isn't it? So, you know, uh, we have the uncanny valley and uh, this robot definitely is still within the uncanny valley uh, area of interaction with people. Um, but they've created this eye contact so the cameras can look at you uh, or whomever. It can make mouth movements. It was placed in front of a camera and a screen. So initially it, it trained itself. It just practiced making facial expressions in front of a camera. And then it saw itself, it self-supervised its own facial learning. Like, how do I move my face? And it started wow. learning. And that was part of the first algorithm, the move movement and what movements, uh, what need to, what, uh, what sensors and motors and thing, uh, servos need to be moved to enable certain facial expressions. And then there was the step of training with people and individuals. Uh, and so the robot uh, then learned to predict 
if someone's going to smile and can actually predict if someone is going to smile up to, uh, I think it's 840 microseconds ahead of when a person is going to smile. So the robot is fast enough and sensitive enough in its detection of micro expressions and uh, the emotions that are involved in facial movements at this point in time uh, that it is able to respond uh, like a mirror. Amazing. It's absolutely amazing. I mean, this to me is the, the not microseconds, milliseconds. I apologize. Uh, so Hod Libson, who is leading this whole team, um, yeah, they're trying to figure out how to create a robot that can uh, really interact with people in a naturalistic way and embody future artificial intelligences. I think it's already doing better than I am. <laughs> I mean, we know uh, children learn from uh, observing their practicing them and observing people around them. And so those games of big expressive facial expressions um, as part of how a, a human brain learns how to express through the face. Um, well, fantastic. Yeah. Science. Robo mirror, science engineering, all the things together. Uh, Will Emo be uh jude law in the future maybe Good. who knows we'll get there i don't want a robo mirror but it's time for bed yes definitely yes. <laughs> <laughs> we have done the science we have talked the things thank you so much for joining me tonight i really appreciate getting to talk about all this stuff with you anytime it's my pleasure to be here Everybody out there, thank you for listening, for being here for the show. If you're in the chat rooms, really appreciate you being here to chat. Those of you who are in our Discord, who are Patreon uh, supporters, all your gifts and uh, images are really appreciated. All the comments have been fantastic, everybody. Aaron Anathema is uh, really looking forward to you getting to episode <laughs> number five, Jess. And Let's figure it out. Let's figure that one out. Um, shout outs, definitely beyond our chat rooms, which I've been watching on Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube and Discord. I also need to thank Fada for uh, his help with social media and show notes on YouTube and other places. Gord, Arnmore, others for making sure our chat rooms are great places to be. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. Rachel, thank you for editing the show. Jess, thank you for joining me. PDX broadsides, et cetera. If people want to keep following you, I know you have said this in a previous episode, but where can people find you more? So you can find me. I'm Dame underscore DNA on Twitter. I'm also on Blue Sky. Uh, I'm on all the social medias, but uh, you can follow the PDX broadsides on Facebook and also pdxbroadsides.com for the next place that we'll be making music about science and space and Shakespeare and Nathan Fillion's bum and a million <gasps> other things. A lot of things. So, yes. And you're, you, your head is framed by Carl Sagan and Bill Nye. That's fantastic. Yeah. These are um, <laughs> uh, both done by Christopher Herndon, who's a Portland based uh, artist. And he did a whole beautiful science series. Uh, he's also got um, a Stephen Hawking and yeah. He's fantastic. Dane Alt is another mm -hmm. one. Uh, Monkey Minion Press. I know Dane Alt. Yes, great. Yeah. And great so he was here in Portland. He's in Kansas City now, but he did a whole book called Eureka about 30 lesser known scientists. And he does all sorts of space and art print. So I love science art. Yay. Let's have more of it. I like, I don't, it, I don't know if I like it either. I don't know. I'm surrounded by it right now. For those of you who only listen to the podcast, I love science <laughs> art. Um, let us finish this out also by thanking the Patreon sponsors. I uh, absolutely must thank all of you who support the show. So a big 
Thank you to Alan Viola, Aaron Anathema, Ka- Arthur Kepler, Craig Potts, Mary Gertz, Teresa Smith, Richard Badge, Bob Coles, Kent Northcote, George Chorus, Pierre Velazarb, John Ratnaswamy, Chris Wozniak, Vagard, Chefstad, Donathan Styles, aka Don Stylo, Ali Coffin, Reagan Shubru, yeah. Sarah Forfar, Don Mundus, P.I.G., Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Andrew Swanson, Fred S. 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, David E. Youngblood, Sean Clarence Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Steve Leesman, aka Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard. Tan Christopher Rappin, Richard, Brendan Minish, Ron, Johnny Gridley, Remy Day, G. Burden, Lattimore, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Audiam, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul Rick Rimmis, Philip Shane, Kurt, Lus- Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, Lawn Makes, EO, Adam Mishkan, er- Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, and Tony Steele. Thank you so much for all of your support on patreon and if any of you are interested in uh supporting us on patreon you can head on over to twist.org and click on that patreon link on next week's show we i don't know jessica well who will you be speaking with i don't know yet i don't know but i'll be i don't know it's magic (laughs) <laughs> this week in science, we'll be back on Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific time, broadcasting live from Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook. Indeed, we will. And okay. if you want to listen to us as a podcast, just look for This Week in Science every place that podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you get your friends to subscribe to. For more information on anything you've heard here today, you can find show notes and links to the stories that we read today. They will be available on twist.org, and you can also sign up for the newsletter. Woohoo! Sometimes we send it out, but we also love your <laughs> feedback. So if you love the show, or if there's just a topic you want us to talk about, or a story you want us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, or another guest uh please let me know send me an email or you know uh hit me up on the social medias um but if you're sending me an email make sure you put twists in the subject line because if you don't your email will be spam filtered into a hypoxic naked mole rack sand puppy collapsed tunnel and it's never going to come back out so uh, just put twists in the subject line Are we ready? Yeah, we're ready. Are you ready? Well, we look forward to discussing science with you again next week. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember, it's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in 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 science.